we're live now. Um, great. Good, good morning. Good, good afternoon. Good evening to uh, everybody who's uh, who's here with us. Um, in the third day of the OTT Conference 2020, the online event. Um, I'm here with Dustin, um, who you all know. For those who've been to our uh, to our conferences, and um, and to do before we start is share with you something that just came out. Erika Perez Leon has been online working on this. Um, this is uh, OTT's 2019 2020 annual review. Um, you can download uh, now uh, here. I'm sorry, I just typed the, uh, the link. And um, so I want to thank Erica for the hard work for that. And of course, I also want to thank Soapbox who've helped us with the design of that uh, review and of the design in general for the conference. And when we do meet live face to face, you'll see all that effort um, the way it was meant to be uh, seen. Um, we have a couple of uh, additions to our conference today. Um, one is that there is an extra parallel session for a bit later um, for those who are interested in sharing their experiences around COVID-19. So we're looking for people who would like to share how the, the crisis has um, has has affected them um, and their think tanks directly. Um, this is a bit later, so if you go to, net, to sessions, you'll see that session uh, open. And also in the expo area, we have created what is called, something called a coffee room. Some of you asked uh, this um, from us, and, um, and, and when we've done this, it allows you to um, meet other people, so a group of people, not just uh, randomly one-to-one, -one, but if you like to um, meet other people, a group of people, maybe someone you want to, through chat, say, let's go and meet at the coffee, the coffee room, uh, you should be able to do that. So try it out and let us know what you think. But anyway, without further ado, we start our third day of the OTT conference. And Dustin, um, who's joining us from Georgia, is going to be leading the way. So Justin, I leave it to you. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for that kind introduction, Enrique. Um, and thanks for having me here. Before I get started, I wanted to thank the entire OTT team for all the hard work that they've done in putting this conference together. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry, I'm getting a phone call rather urgently and they're calling back and calling back. Perfect timing. Um, but so I wanted to thank the OTT team in particular for doing this. Um, I also wanted to say that I hope everyone's doing as good as can be possible in this current context, which we're all struggling through at the moment in time. So without further ado, um, so my name is Dustin Gilbreth. I'm the Deputy Research Director at the Caucasus Research Resource Centers, Georgia. And I'm the Communications Manager at Transparify. Um, and today I'm gonna be talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence for think tanks and for policy people. And I'm gonna be talking about it in a bit of a different way than what we normally hear, or at least what I normally hear when I see think tanks talking about AI and machine learning. And what I usually see in the think tank world and the think tank discourse is a conversation about the implications of artificial intelligence um, and machine learning for think tanks. And specifically, what does it mean for the societies that we're in? What does it mean um, for surveillance? What does it mean for, sorry, just shutting off my phone as I've gotten three calls and this started immediately. Um, so what does it mean um, for privacy concerns in the United States is something else that is happening um, in a conversation. Instead of talking about AI and machine learning in that way, instead what I'm gonna be talking about today is how um, think tanks can incorporate AI and machine learning as tools into their toolboxes. And in doing so, I'm going to make two points that I think are important. The first is that AI and machine learning are probably more familiar than you think. 
Um, and the second one is the prediction problems um, or more of a framework, I guess. So the second one is that um, whenever you need a, when you have a prediction problem as opposed to a causal inference problem, that's probably a good sign that you need to deal with machine learning or a machine learning or artificial intelligence application might be appropriate. Um, by way of introduction, I'm going to show you some of the results of a project that my organization CRC Georgia implemented. Um, and it's called the Russian Propaganda Barometer Project. And in this project, we heavily leaned on machine learning and artificial intelligence. So in the first, um, the questions that we were trying to answer, the research questions that we were aimed at looking at, um, were what are known sources of Russian propaganda saying and how are people reacting? And the inspiration behind this was that lots of people in Georgia have been talking about Russian propaganda. Um, it's become a global issue in recent years, as we're all aware, but for Georgia, it's been a long-term issue. And we didn't see some form of systematic quantification of the conversation that sources of Russian propaganda um, were having and how people were reacting to them. And so that was one inspiration for the project. The second inspiration um, and the question that we all had is, who's most at risk of being influenced by Russian propaganda in Georgia? Because we saw lots of conversations about Russian language media and banning Russian language media even, and the different implications for freedom of speech were quite important, as well as important for our policy on communicating and targeting um, different groups of people with different messages if the country is to stay pro-Western. So to address these two research questions, we use two artificial intelligence or machine learning tools. And the first was in the realm of natural language processing. And these included thematic modeling and sentiment analysis. And these were used uh, mainly to address the first research question up there. So what's thematic modeling? It basically identifies when strings of words are often um, cited together or used together. And based on that, attempts to um, identify basically the topic of what people are talking about. Sentiment analysis is something that you might be more familiar with. Um, and this is something that um, basically it quantifies how positive or negative towards a given subject people are talking about that subject. Um, and then to these were used to monitor the discourse, the Russian propaganda discourse in Georgia, and look at how people were reacting to it. So the second thing that we did to address the second research question was a K-nearest neighbors algorithm. Um, we fed lots of data into it. And based on that, we created an algorithm to predict the chance that someone would be at risk of being influenced by Russian propaganda. The intuition behind this kind of thing is that um, basically fish of a similar type swim in the same school. And so based on the data into the algorithm, it makes predictions um, about which school of people or which category of people or which attitudinal grouping there is um, among a certain population. And so I was hoping that I would be able to show you all um, the dashboard that we built for this. It's at awdb.g, but um, right before the presentation, it seems to have gone offline temporarily and the application's not launching. Um, but what you can see on the dashboard um, in terms of that first research question is a day by day and week by week um, quantification of what different sources of Russian propaganda are talking about um, on Georgian language Facebook. Um, and this is for public pages. And what you can see is the spikes in response to different events. And so if you look at the orange, and particularly the orange around here in June, what's happening there is there's the first gay pride parade is announced as being planned for this time period. Um, and we see the far right responding and talking a great deal uh, right there. The other really interesting finding that we had, and I wanted to show you again on the dashboard, but unfortunately isn't available um, at this moment in time, is the sentiment analysis that we did for this project in which we 
actually found that most of what um, a lot of NGOs and think tanks were describing as pro-Russian sources of propaganda, they actually spoke more negatively about Russia than the West. Um, and this was all except for a few of the hundred or so sources of propaganda that we looked at. And based on this, our conclusion was that these were actually not necessarily sources of Russian propaganda, but more far-right nationalist groups. And I know many of you will be familiar with the discourse on Russian propaganda, and particularly in Eastern Europe, we see that Russia supports far-right groups um, and shares similar messages. That's something that we think is distinctly possible, um, but we also think that this nuance on it is quite important in understanding how to address um, the issue at hand. For the second research question, what I'm showing on the slide here is the predicted probability of being pro-Western, pro-Russian, or an isolationist, and having basically inchoate views or not having well-defined views about foreign policy preferences. And this is from the K-nearest neighbors. Um, basically, I took this, the predictions of the K-nearest neighbors algorithm, and then put them into a regression. And what it shows is the relative risk levels among a number of basic demographic groups, thus enabling a targeting strategy based on this machine learning analysis. So rather than the conclusions of the above being important, what I think is important is that it shows that machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques aren't necessarily, um, so, well, I would rephrase that, Machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques um, can be useful for generating policy insights on a wide range of topics. Um, and they're speaking about foreign policy, um, which is a subject that we might not normally think about when it comes to artificial intelligence and mean machine learning. The next point that I wanted to make is that AI and machine learning aren't all that unfamiliar. Um, they're in the world around us, as we all probably know, the advertisements that we Google search are in part determined based on machine learning and uh, um, uh, artificial intelligence. The same with Facebook on what advertisements are shown to us. Uh, when it comes to factories and more industrial processes, machine learning and artificial intelligence are making headways and in energy efficiency um, in all sorts of ways among a wide, wide variety of other subjects. What you might not be aware of though, is that a lot of the tools in the machine learning and artificial intelligence toolbox are actually quite familiar to a lot of quantitative social sciences and scientists. And so the last quantitative social science paper that you read might have used some of the tools that are common in machine learning. The example that I'm thinking of most here is logistic regression, which in the machine learning world is a common workhorse because it produces robust predictions for many problems. Um, the difference with the last social science paper that you probably read, um, that it probably was looking at um, the problem in terms of causal inference rather than as a prediction problem. And that's an important distinction. And it's something which can give a bit of a signposting in terms of when machine learning and artificial intelligence might be useful applications um, for your research project and for think tanks to actually use. So just briefly cover this distinction. Um, a lot of us will be familiar with impact evaluations, randomized control trials, and quasi-experiments in terms of policy analysis. And when doing these types of analysis, we're trying to figure out if we implement program X, will outcome Y happen or will it move? Um, will we have a better result? This isn't the kind of thing that you generally are doing with machine learning. Well, there is some arguments um, and Esther Duflo has a nice lecture from about two years ago on this subject specifically. But the kind of thing that we're looking at here um, and when machine learning and artificial intelligence might be more useful is when we need to make a prediction and we're not necessarily concerned with cause and effect. The classic example of this is when you ask, do I need an umbrella to go out? You're not really concerned about what's causing the rain or the lack of rain tomorrow morning. 
but you are concerned with whether you need an umbrella. And this is what machine learning tools are generally quite good at. So to think of one, to provide one example um, where that was done. So the behavioral in insights team, the nudge unit, they started a big data team a few years back. And one of the first problems that they looked at was school inspections and trying to improve their efficiency. And what they did is they took all the old data um, from school inspections to identify which schools um, were more likely to have problems um, and more likely to fail inspections. Prior to this, there had been a random inspection system. And what the machine learning analysis that they conducted showed was that you could predict with about 80% accuracy which schools were more likely to have problems. Therefore, instead of using random inspections, you could focus on those schools which were more likely to um, have problems and more effectively use your resources. Um, aside from this, predictions are generally something that there's a lot of data out there for, and there's a lot of scope for predicting policy problems through lots of different monitoring tools. So for example, water testing. Um, one application that I've seen recently from RAND is that um, fentanyl, so products of fentanyl, uh, opioid drug, um, appear in water and there's regular water testing. And if you test for that in the water, you could figure out something, oh, maybe there's going to be a fentanyl, there's a severe fentanyl problem here because there's been an increase in usage in this location. Um, air quality data is also something that's often read, readily available and has policy implications around it. Another example that was done over the last few years in Kenya, if I'm not mistaken, is trying to figure out hate speech and then target responses to that based on Facebook data. Um, just yesterday, um, Till Bruckner, who I believe is here at the moment, tagged me in a tweet pointing to how Bruegels is actually making the argument tomorrow that artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, and big data need to be used in the fight against the coronavirus. And so this is something that I think is all around us. Um, and it's something that I think more and more Part of um, think tanks can be doing. Um, and they're really useful and really clear ways for think tank style research. And so that's basically what I want to say. I'm just going to say um, the things that I hope I've communicated, which are that artificial intelligence and machine learning are really useful for think tanks. And there's things that we should be doing more of. And they're not that hard or foreign to us for lots of think tanks that have a quantitative person or a room full of quantitative people, there's a slight change in the thinking, um, moving from causal inference to prediction problems. But the world of things is not all that different and the tools are often the same or very similar. I've just modified. So thank you for your attention. Um, and I'd be happy to have a conversation and I'm actually looking forward to the conversation today. So with that, I'll open up the floor and turn the floor back over to Enrique. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dustin. That was, um, that, was, um, that was a very useful, very clear message um, and, and certainly encouraging us already um, to uh, reach out to you and, uh, and find out more about how we can, uh, we can incorporate this into our own work. Uh, there, were a couple of, um, there were a couple of questions um, and and I've just noticed a main consistent comment from Sonia. So I'll start with the questions that are clarifying questions and we'll test your ability to uh, show us how easy, easy this is or not, not so difficult. Um, Jessica asks um, about um, whether thematic modeling and sentiment analysis um, is an outgrowth of content analysis and media studies. Um, or, or what is the relationship there? So I'm not a big media studies person, to be perfectly frank. So um, distinctly possible um, in terms of the intellectual history going on. In terms of the actual um, process of doing this, uh, we actively did content analysis actually in combination with the traditional um, sort of machine learning thing. Um, we actually have a bunch of posts that we're looking at saying like, okay, and doing sense checking of things. Um, does this content match up with what the algorithm's telling us? One thing that I don't think I said, but you absolutely need is the traditional think tank analysis skills. Because 
those numbers that you see, they don't have any meaning without any context. And that's one thing that think tanks can always bring. Um, and yeah, it's something where we had even one of our colleagues, he, through this project, he was a master's student at the time, and he did half of his master's dissertation using the data that we collected, and half of it was a qualitative uh, master's thesis, sort of looking at how the far right in Georgia at Turkish people and talks about Turkish people in the country. Um, and yeah, it was excellent work that he did, so yeah. Great. Uh, Marilia Pereira uh, asks, can you explain more about the methodology and how you did the sentiment analysis or the thematic modeling? So the thematic modeling, there's pretty well-developed packages. Um, and the same thing with sentiment analysis that you can use in either R or Python um, and probably some other programming languages. Um, and we just use basically standard out-of-the-box things there. What we did do that was more unique, though, is... We took, um, so Georgian is a relatively small language. It's spoken by about four to five million people on earth at most. Um, and so what we needed to do was limitize the language, which basically means break it into its component parts. Um, and from there, what you do is you can detect what word is being spoken. Um, and sort of like German, what happens is you combine words sort of in Georgian, it's a bit different with the grammar and that's an oversimplification, um, but that's sort of the tricky part inside of this. Um, fortunately, if you're working in a larger language, someone's probably already done that and you can probably download the package that does this. So any of the world's major languages have this already developed and lots of the ones that are smaller. Um, so for example, we're considering doing some work in Armenia doing similar things. And as far as we're aware, you can, for Armenian, which is an even smaller language than Georgian, just download these things um, off the shelf. The sentiment analysis, what we did was less than perfect, but still good is basically take a sentiment dictionary. Um, and this is basically another thing that you can download off the shelf. Um, and word by word, it knows whether it's generally positive or negative. Um, it's less, than perfect, particularly in languages that it's not so well developed in like Georgian, but it's generally better than, yeah, it's not too, too complicated. It takes a bit of thinking on that, but, and that's honestly the more complicated side of what we did. Yeah, I think ask, uh, ask a broader question about, about AI. Um, is it, Say main criticism of AI solving social in solving social problems is that it can frequently reproduce social biases and inequalities. Um, how do you make sure that you have good understanding of context, culture, with the use of AI uh, in an analysis of data? So the first thing is, I mean, the sort of goes back to the first question where you need that traditional kind of think tank analysis and qualitative analysis inside of this. Um, in terms of being aware, you. I mean, we all are aware of our contexts and we all may have biases. Well, we all definitely have biases, right? Um, but trying to be aware of those, like in any other kind of analysis, is what's most important. Generally speaking, um, whenever we find something inside of traditional survey data or other data, um, these less clear forms of data, or these newer forms of data, and it's reproducing some societal stereotype we're definitely thinking about how to interpret it and what it might say. But more often than not, what we actually see when we're doing data analysis, at least in Georgia, is that it's not reproducing the standard stereotypes and it can actually be used to combat those um, in some meaningful way. Thanks. I'm just gonna send um, a little survey to people to see what uh, reaction they have. Um, it's a little test. Um, in, in case they've been, um, so there's a little poll there. Um, I'm just asking you if you haven't yet, you know, will you, will you find out more about how AI and machine learning can contribute to your work? I, um, I certainly, I certainly will. Um, as I think, as you say, it can certainly help us with questions of prediction looking forward. And often what we see in think tanks analysis is that it's very good at assessing what has happened. Um, or as you say, 
you know, why it's happened. And, and it is important to do this, um, but we often um, fail to be able to offer recommendations based on what might happen going forward and might, might take place in, in the future. And often that's what policymakers are interested in, um, the, next, the next steps along the way. Um, so I see many, I see most of the people who responded are saying yes. Um, how do you, how do you get started? So if, I mean, this is a little question I have, you know, um, the first impression is this is, this is, this is very difficult. This is daunting. I'm going to need some techie people join my team. Um, what was the, what was the trigger? What was the decision making process to get started in the, in, in, in this, in this project? So it's actually something that we saw um, and we, we, we heard lots of people talking about it and we were all actually quite skeptical um, at first. My boss actually, when me and my colleague David who um, did this project sort of came to him with the ideas originally about using this, he thought we were crazy. Um, and we started explaining what it actually was. So when you hear artificial intelligence, you think about machines manipulating all sorts of things, right? And you're like, well, no, I mean, this is a method for statistical models. And this is a method for trying to look at who's more or less likely to do something like we're already doing. And when you get into the details of it and start looking at it, you realize, well, this is really similar to traditional statistical things. It's just using a bit of different tools. Um, and that was sort of where we realized, oh, I just need to have a few different packages in my normal workflow to start doing things with this. Um, the artificial intelligence side of it, we also had been thinking about it, um, particularly because we get large amounts of text um, when we do in-depth interviews and focus groups and thinking about how to process those in a more efficient way. Uh, yeah. Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Dustin. And uh, for those interested, you can read about this, uh, in, uh, this, this project that Dustin described in the annual review. So I'm just gonna share the link again, um, where he, he is accompanied by many other authors um, discussing AI and, its, and their implication to um, think tanks. Anyway, that's, that's it for our, our first keynote, uh, or last keynote of this, um, of this conference. Thank you very much, um, Dustin, for this. Um, and again, I invite everybody else who's online to um, join us in the networking session if you want to randomly meet people, see who, who else is on, 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 this, on this conference. Um, but also if you want to try out that uh, coffee room that I mentioned before um, and, and get together in, in a slightly larger, larger group. Uh, we have two sessions, two parallel sessions starting in 30 minutes. Um, one of those sessions is, is going to be addressing communications and, uh, and, and, and technology. Uh, this is Soapbox, um, um, always fantastic sessions at our conferences. So uh, they've been uh, preparing for this one quite, um, for quite some time. I do recommend it. And the other one is a last minute one um, that came out of conversations yesterday that we've created, which is going to be addressing the, the effects that the COVID crisis is having on think tanks. Um, and those who are joining us, we, we're going to ask you to share, you know, what's happening to your organization financially in terms of governance, in terms of staff. So hopefully something also uh, positive will come out of that for us. Mm -hmm. um, I do encourage you to join both, both sessions if you can and continue the conversation through the chat um, option. Great. Um, I should say one more thing. The 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 event is gonna the platform is gonna be open for another hour more or less after we finish. So again, uh, please stick around, continue talking to people, meeting them in the expo spaces, um, in networking spaces. Um, we hope to um, see you around for a bit longer. Uh, Dustin, I saw you wanted to say something. I just wanted to say thanks um, for everyone's attention for that and hope everyone, looking forward to seeing you all at the next few panels. Thank you very much, Dustin, um, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.